An arcane sigil alights across the stone door in the mithril chains binding it shut, moments before it creaks open. The grinding rumble of granite across the ground echoes through the chamber where your party waits. Stepping back, the wizard smiles at their accomplishment, deciphering the ancient script hiding the passcode. Stale air buffets the dense plate armor of your fighter before they step forward, raising their shield against the impermeable darkness. As the door screeches to a halt, your party advances with the soft white illumination flooding from the near cleric's holy symbol. The light dances around ancient books, long abandoned alchemical experiments, and extremely clean floors. The rogue mentions how spotless the oddly placed wooden chamber appears before their keen senses pick up movement near the large mosaic. Sensing danger, you form rank behind the paladin and fighter, and your party advances on the lone figures standing there, their back to you all. They turn to face the party as the light pours around them to show images of the Syrian royal family. His skeletal face, bound by leathery scraps of skin and oiled bandages, looks around at you all. Motes of green light shine from his empty eye sockets, piercing into your very souls. As you ready to defend yourself against this ancient undead, his dry voice echoes through the eerily silent chamber. Welcome, dear friends. I've been waiting for you. Time to roll initiative, everyone. Today we are talking about the Lich. Hearing in the lore from all editions, these powerful wizards take their drives for knowledge and power to extremes avoided by most mortals. They are created by various means, from deals with the demon prince of undead, to crafting a ritual binding their souls to a particular bloodline. But each lich has a few common points. Powerful magic abilities and the force of will to persist past death. The common lich views undeath as a means of preserving themselves beyond death. Most are driven insane by the passing of aeons and dealing with magical forces that span generations, while seeking for long-forgotten secrets. Typically skeletal and decayed, their bodies and flesh withered from ages, only a sickly, pale green light shines from out of their empty eye sockets. We typically see them described as wearing moldering robes and jewelry from ages past, as a way of describing their lack of dependence on that body. Each story is different, and there are hundreds of ways to follow the path to lichdom. Many turn to the demon prince of undead, Orcus, for the secret ritual. At the cost of being completely at his bidding, the ritual from Orcus ties her soul to him and allows him to instantly destroy them t with a thought. To claim his prize, a caveat not mentioned in the original agreement often. After all, a deal with a demon is far riskier than a bargain with a devil. The Orcus Bound Lich often sends souls to him over the span of hundreds of years, or funds ways to create abyssal portals, secretly allowing Orcus to invade the material realm as he often tries. Other methods of transcending mortality include Draco Liches, created by the Cult of the Dragon to control dragon kind. For even while they are long-lived, those ancient worms are not immortal. And sometimes death is a looming prospect that many cannot face. An elven Balnorn is another way to create a lich outside of a pact with Orcus. A Belnorn Lich is created by the Seldrain in the Forgotten Realms. They become custodians to their family lines. Rarely viewed as inherently evil, unlike a wizard crafting a pact with a demon lord, the Belnorn were rare gifts to the elven people, and becoming one was an honor. In other settings, and by definition homebrew settings, there can be a vast multitude of lich-like monsters and methods to create them. 
The ritual to become a lich starts with the brewing of a vile potion, using toxic alchemical reagents and rare substrates. This is done in steps as they craft their phylactery, the second but most important part of their ritual. The crafting of a phylactery is a unifying thread among lich creation, and even this can be anything the DM can imagine. Typically, however, it is a small box, amulet, or container with a hollow space inside, whereas the etching of eldritch sigils of binding immortality and the true name of the lich to be take place. Once the entire ritual is completed, they drink their poison and their soul is drawn into the phylactery. Killed instantly, they rise once more as undead, their soul forever trapped in their phylactery, while their physical body is able to explore the realm without fear of permanent destruction. In our world, the word phylactery is referencing a small leather box containing Hebrew texts, usually on vellum, worn by Jewish men at morning prayer as a reminder to keep the law. The concept of a soul container can be traced to many other ancient cultures as well, such as the Hanping during the Han Dynasty in China. It's currently unsure if this was an inclusion was influenced during the tape, first playtesting and uh, experiences at the late Gary Gygax's table. In the game, if a lich is killed, the physical body reforms in a few days around the phylactery. As a DM, this can be anything that contains the power of the magic needed, such as the sealed chamber with magically attuned crystals, or my personal favorite, the bloodline of a specific family with the lich's soul possessing the body of the youngest in the family as it slowly overtakes and absorbs their soul. This is a particularly cruel, if effective, way to introduce a moral conundrum to your players. The power to sustain the magic preserving its body and sanity, the lich has to feed souls into their phylactery. In 5th edition, this is done using the imprisonment spell to seal the victim away. Instead of targeting a certain prison, it targets the phylactery. The only method to release and save the creature is to find the phylactery within 24 hours and then cast the spell magic at at least 9th level to free their soul. Or the titular wish spell might pull them out of this dire situation. Over time, if a lich forgets or fails to or gives up trying to feed their vessel with souls, their physical body begins to fall apart eventually leading to the option of giving up entirely and becoming a demi-lich. The most famous lich turned demi-lich is also on display on the front of the DM's guide and the Tomb of Annihilation books for 5th edition, a Sarek. Most famous for his Tomb of Horrors, an Indol dungeon delve that serves as a standard of sorts for meat-grinding dungeons, his history reaches all the way back to 1st edition and the modern day. It displaces reach across multiple planes of existence and gives a scope to how powerful these creatures can really become. With some people even suspecting that his 5th edition persona knows the true nature of the multiverse and the reason that Thar's Dune is sealed away in Karsiri. The recent additions to the monsters with lair actions, legendary actions, and a long-standing threat of having to find the phylactery, the Lich has been more than capable of acting as a final boss for long or high-level campaigns. The DM's options are nearly limitless with this entry in the Monster Manual. The possibility of having a benevolent Lich as the party's patron, either as a true dark puppet master or genuine good-hearted undead guardian. It grants the lower level party a chance to interact with this titular monster. And that's all for today about the Lich. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope it was entertaining and maybe it gave your DM some ideas. Let me know if you have any other requests for different monsters or different subjects to cover with our lore videos. Once again, Thank you so very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.